Carrie Silken, who owned Ring of Honor from 2002 to 2011 before selling to Sinclair, and then he stayed on as an executive in the company. On a recent episode of the Matt Memories from Madison Square Garden podcast, which he sometimes co-hosts with John Arezzi, he had a little something to say about his former promotion, which is now owned by Tony Khan. He is not happy about the way that ROH is currently being presented. He said, Ring of Honor of that era tried to show some respect to professional wrestling. Sure, we had some wacky stuff. Sure, we had the flippy dippy do." It was coming into fashion, but you know, the flippy dippy do was going on with Edouard Carpentier, too. Carpentier, so you know, is a pretty famous wrestler who debuted in the 50s, former NWA World's Champion, who did a lot of acrobatic type stuff at a time when not a lot of people were doing that in wrestling. Silken said, Ring of Honor, there was some good... There was some good pro wrestling going on in that segment of it, but right now, Ring of Honor, it's like no one cares at all. I don't care how much money Tony Khan has, it is not being treated very well. Well, to be fair, those last few years under Sinclair were not exactly exhilarating television either, so I'm not sure it's much more... I'm not sure it's much worse off now than it was before Tony Khan bought it. Ring of Honor feels like a dead brand. I, I've said this before. Ring of Honor feels like a dead brand. I don't care how many buys the pay-per-views do, and they, they do a hell of a lot better than they did under Sinclair. I think it was the, uh, the last death before Dishonor, before Tony acquired the company, did something like 800 buys. The show before that did 3,500 buys. But that very next show did 800 buys. That's a hell of a difference in a three-month span. That's horrendous. That's a company that was beating down Death's door before Tony Khan threw it a lifeline and threw millions of dollars at it to try to keep it alive. And to his credit, the big Ring of Honor shows usually deliver quality-wise. And a lot of people rave about them. And to compare, you know, their Death Before Dishonor show two years ago did over 30,000 buys between TV and digital. I don't know what last year's show did, but I'm pretty sure it was down. Still up from the Sinclair days, but I'm sure it was down from uh, 2022. My issue with Ring of Honor is not that it exists. I don't hate the fact that Ring of Honor exists. My issue with Ring of Honor has been the integration with AEW. And as an AEW viewer, oftentimes, you know, when I see Ring of Honor shit on, on the show, I don't give a shit. I don't watch AEW TV to watch Ring of Honor. If I wanted to watch Ring of Honor, I would watch Ring of Honor. I also don't see how having somebody like Kyle Fletcher, for example, who is the television champion, constantly doing jobs on AEW TV while he is the Ring of Honor TV champion, or booking the Ring of Honor world champion on an AEW television uh, program like a mid-card guy, does the title or the brand any good other than just getting more eyeballs on them because AEW has a TV deal and Ring of Honor does not. I don't see the benefit. I don't see the added value. That's also a big part of why those Ring of Honor shows do so much better buy rate-wise than they were doing before at the end of the Sinclair run because Tony uses AEW talent on those shows. Super Card of Honor this year had Eddie Kingston as the champion defending in the main event. They had Jay White on the show with the rest of Bullet Club Gold. They had Hikaru Shida. These are people that have been established on AEW television. Last year's shows, you had Claudio and Willow Nightingale either either challenging for or defending titles. Go back two years ago, you had Chris Jericho as the Ring of Honor World Champion. FTR was on the show. That's when they had that classic trilogy with the Briscoes. And that's one of the things that I'm actually happy we got from Tony Khan buying Ring of Honor. We never would have gotten those three matches before Jay Briscoe died had he not, you know, bought the company and booked that series of matches. But he has to use AEW talent in order for them to do well because he wants to try to make some money back off of it. I think Tony would benefit from outsourcing the booking to somebody else who could do a capable job and take it off his hands. Scott Demore is a name that comes up a lot of times. I think he would be a great choice if he was interested. You know, he's, he was doing well in TNA. He's got a good mind for the business, but he's under a non-compete until next year. So for now, legally, that just can't happen. I don't know that Tony wants to cede booking power over Ring of Honor. He bought it. He might want to run the entire thing himself. 
you know, the reason he bought it in the first place was because he was a huge Ring of Honor fan growing up. He was a mark, like you and me. And he didn't want Vince McMahon to get his hands on it just to shut it down and take the tape library, which is exactly what they would have done. And that's where the real value is, if we're being honest. It's in that tape library. Look, look at all the former Ring of Honor talents that are populating the WWE and AEW rosters right now. Some of the biggest stars in the business came out of Ring of Honor, made a name for themselves, made, made their bones in Ring of Honor. You don't think that footage has value? Ring of Honor will never be what it once was. In, in the mid to late 2000s, that was the golden era of Ring of Honor. That was the era of CM Punk and Samoa Joe and Brian Danielson and Nigel McGuinness and the Briscoes and Homicide and the Age of the Fall and all, all this stuff. It can never be that again. Back then, you had WWE, you had TNA, and then there was ROH. And what ROH was giving wrestling fans was something that they could not find anywhere else. That's what appealed to me about it. That's why I started going to the shows in 2006. And there was never a single Ring of Honor show that I ever went to. And back then, there was no TV show. So it was just the live events I was going to. Not one time did I go to a Ring of Honor event here in New York and not have a good time. It was just, it was something unlike what I was watching on TV at the time. It filled a void. NXT back then didn't even exist. Once Triple H decided to turn NXT into a super indie, that, I don't want to say caused the downfall of Ring of Honor, but it, it sped up the downfall of Ring of Honor from what it used to be. And when AEW started, and you had the competition between AEW and NXT, ROH was left in the dust. That void that they used to fill for a lot of wrestling fans was now being filled by something that had more money behind it and better production. You know, Carrie Silkin is right to feel like nobody cares about ROH anymore. I get it. He owned it. It was his baby. The only reason Ring of Honor survived as long as it did was because he bankrolled it. He wasn't doing the booking that was Gabe Sapolsky for the longest time and then Delirious later on. It wasn't like Carrie was booking the fucking shows, but without his money, Ring of Honor would have died a long time ago. So I get it. He's got a connection to it. It's his baby. He wants it to be treated a certain way. He's right to feel that way. I understand it. But he's comparing it to a time that it can never go back to. If you just look at it for what it is, there probably is not a person alive today who cares more about Ring of Honor right now than Tony Khan. And I know that sounds crazy because of the way he's booking it, but why else would he even bother unless he really genuinely cared about the brand? We can disagree over the way he's going about doing it, but if he didn't give a shit, he wouldn't have spent his money in the first place to buy it. Why else would he acquire it and probably lose money on it if he didn't care about it, right? The alternative was death. Maybe Carrie would have been okay with that. Just, just let it die. Let it die and put the catalog on Peacock. I think Ring of Honor could be useful as a place to develop talent. And by develop, I don't mean taping a few matches before Dynamite once a week and doing a pay-per-view once every four months. I mean really investing in it, having one place that he can make their new home base where they can tape television and maybe also do live events, you know, even if it's just locally, to give these people work. I mean, I know a lot of them can just book themselves on the indies. A lot of them are already working on the independent scene anyway, but you're not necessarily developing anybody that way. But that's a very expensive endeavor and one that he may not think is worth the expense. It seems to me like he probably has a formal relationship now with maybe the Nightmare Factory, or, or I know Dustin has a school. Maybe he can formalize that in some way and create this whole network where they could be trained and developed somewhere else, and he doesn't have to worry about it. He can outsource that, right? But he's got a pipeline to these people. Again, maybe that's happening in an informal way right now, but if you wanted to formalize the process, he may not think it's worth the expense. WWE has spent millions and millions of dollars on that. The WWE PC model is finally paying off, finally bearing fruit, but it took years for them to get that system to where it is today and a lot of failed projects. And now they're actually creating stars of their own for all the people who wonder why Tony doesn't just give Rampage to Ring of Honor and make that an ROH show and get them on TV. It's because Warner Brothers Discovery does not want Ring of Honor. It's their time slot. It's not his. They didn't give Ring of Honor an hour every Friday night. They gave it to AEW. 
It's like that one mailbag question I got a couple of weeks ago asking me, why can't WWE try to revive WCW 25 years later and just give Raw to WCW when they move to Netflix? And SmackDown could be the WWE show because Netflix didn't pay $5 billion for a dead brand. They paid for WWE. Tony Khan has tried and failed to get Ring of Honor a deal with Warner Brothers Discovery. They don't want it. Why would they? TBS did not even want Chris Jericho on that final battle show two years ago to defend the ROH title when he was the champion. Cooler heads prevailed, and he dropped the title on that show, but they did not even want him there. That's how little the suits there think of Ring of Honor. Tony had the chance to make a deal for ROH with the CW Network two years ago. Remember that report from House of Wrestling? And by the way, whatever happened to that? <laughs> whatever happened to Nick Hausman? Him and his website, they just fell off the face of the earth after the whole Jericho controversy with Kylie Ray. Maybe he fell into the Jericho vortex, never to return. But Tony did later confirm the report. He said, yeah, we had conversations, but the timing wasn't right. The timing wasn't right because what he's been betting on is that he'll be able to get that show on a Warner property, or he'll be able to leverage the library into a larger streaming deal for AEW programming on Max. Maybe he will. We should find out very soon. But that's where his head is at with Ring of Honor. And in the meantime, he can just run it, you know, as a bare bones operation, throw up a few pay-per-views each year that he knows people are going to rave about. And uh, they'll, they'll rate very highly on Cage Match, which he loves. Hopefully he'll make a little bit of money off them and he'll keep it barely alive so that it still has a pulse. But that's about as good as it's going to get. That may be upsetting to Carrie Silken, but I'm not sure what else he expects Ring of Honor would be right now. What, what, like, what does he envision Ring of Honor being, realistically? Like, if Tony went full-on developmental with it, I don't get the sense that he would be too happy about that either. It just sounds to me like he's waxing nostalgic about a Ring of Honor that has not existed for many years. Yes, they put, what was it, 15,000, 16,000 people in Madison Square Garden five years ago for the G1 Supercard? That was on the back of New Japan. Okay, let's not kid ourselves here. Without New Japan, they would never have come close to half that. Ring of Honor has not exactly been uh, booming for many years. But they have an event coming up this week. Death Before Dishonor on Friday at the Esports Auditorium in Arlington. Mark Briscoe defends the Ring of Honor world title against AEW's own Roderick Strong in the main event. And Athena defends her Ring of Honor women's title against Queen Amanada. And finally here, PW Insider says that they can confirm that it is not a matter of if, but when Dark Side of the Ring Season 6 will premiere on Vice, as work on the next season is already underway. The production team is already filming interviews. Some of the topics discussed internally by production for next season include episodes on Ludwig Borga. I mean, there's no shortage of material there. Billy Jack Haynes who is still in police custody, as far as I know, after shooting and killing his wife earlier this year, who was suffering from dementia. I think he may be suffering from the same thing. And Dennis Coraluzzo, who is a promoter and former president of the NWA, most famous for being swerved by Todd Gordon and Paul Heyman after they had Shane Douglas throw down the NWA title after he won it, at which point Eastern Championship Wrestling folded as an NWA affiliate and Extreme Championship Wrestling was formed. Extreme, like, like, like a phoenix rising from the ashes. A new ECW was born, so I'm sure that will be central to any episode they do on Coraluzo. You know, when Season 5 ended, I gave you guys a bunch of possible ideas that I would like to see for a Season 6. Ludwig Borga was one of them. Uh, I also suggested Rick Rude. I mentioned Ashley Massaro, Daphne, Sweet and Sour Larry Sweeney. I'm going to keep saying it because I think that would make for a good topic. And it's not like they haven't covered lesser known names before. I mean, we got an episode on fucking Chris Colt this past season. Uh, rock and Roll Buck Zumov, a real piece of slime, but perfect, I think, for this series. And uh, you, I mean, you want to talk dark. There's a dark story for you. And I threw out the Heroes of Wrestling pay-per-view from 1999, which is maybe the worst show of all time. So five seasons in so far, there's still plenty of content for them to cover. And I know they've already been touched upon in past episodes, but 
Vince McMahon and Tammy Sitch. I mean, my God, you can get season seven and eight out of those two alone. So they've got plenty of content left.